Welcome, I'm Mokhar Rizvi and this is Sculp. On today's show, we'll be discussing Islamophobia in the U.S. and financial corruption in Iran. You are a terrorist. That was one of two handwritten notes a 10-year-old Muslim girl at a Boston school received in her cubby. What does that say about the state of Islamophobia in the United States? Remember that hate crimes have gone up by 17 percent, according to the FBI. Meanwhile, in Iran, a man dubbed the Sultan of Coins has been executed for trading in two tons of gold coins, a result of a stricter anti-corruption drive. At a time of heightened sanctions, how should one perceive such court rulings? Let's now start with the United States and the hate crimes issue there. We're joined by our esteemed guests, our in-house analysts, uh, Kirsten Seymour, as well as Moise Amja. Thank you very much for both of you for joining us. Um, before we get to the both of you, we're going to play a few clips to just contextualize this for our viewers as well as for our guests as well. We're going to start off with the parents of this girl. Mind you, the girl has not been named because she is a minor. Our main concern as a family is the safety of... Uh our kids that attend the school along with the safety of all the kids who attend. It's sad to see that kids at this age are uh, dwelling in racism when they don't really know what it is and how it affects uh, the other kids around them. She's in her quiet state right now which is more alarming for us because she's not like that. She's upbeat, she's always outside playing in the cold and stuff and she's refraining from doing that because she's scared. Certainly a disturbing recording there, of course, by the parents of this girl who no doubt has been affected by the situation. Now let's listen very quickly to the principal of the school uh, where this girl goes. I mean, I've always felt it's important to be transparent with students and with parents. So we, I went in and said that one of our classmates, Maymuna, got a very upsetting note and I told them that it said, you're a terrorist. And the students, well, some of the students didn't know what a terrorist was, so we had to explain that. And then I did explain to them that, you know, this is unacceptable. And I said, it would be upsetting for any of us to receive that note, but the fact is Maymuna is Muslim, and sending that note to a Muslim student becomes a hate crime. And we talked about what a hate crime is, and I said, I think it's really important that all students write a note to her. And they did. I went to each of the four classrooms. Every student wrote a note. And I said, even if Maymuna, if you don't know Maymuna that well or you're not best friends with her, it's important that you write something that lets her know that you stand against this type of uh, act. All right, so now we've heard everyone involved in the situation speak about how it's affected this little girl and how it's affected the school community. Let's now go to our esteemed guests who are, who are joining us. Um, Kirsten, I'll throw to you first. Uh, what are your thoughts on this case? What are your thoughts on the statements by the parents and, of course, the principal? Well, first of all, I mean, it's just very sad, isn't it, for a, a girl in fifth grade to get a threat like that, whatever the basis is. Um, but looking at the, the deeper issue, is this a hate crime? There's no question that this is a hate crime. The crime, the, the law is explicit. It's not opaque. Um, it's simple. Crimes manifest evidence based on race, religion, sexual orientation. And obviously, this is an attack on her for being a Muslim. You're a terrorist. But the distinctive points of the two threats, one is not a threat, it's a label. You're a terrorist, okay? That's one thing. The second is, I'm going to kill you, which is a whole nother level. And I don't think that's just a hate crime because I looked up the word hate and it, it basically says extreme dislike. The word extreme means dangerous. So I think the terms are a little bit unclear mm. when we say hate crime. How serious are we taking that? What does it mean? You know. Where do we? Where is that definition yeah. falling for young kids? Yeah. So I think that's that's an issue. Is the terminology itself hate crime? Yeah. Do you agree with that, Moise? Because you know it's important, isn't it, for society? It's not just about Muslims, of course. Minorities in the United States nowadays, ever since Trump has come into office, are facing all sorts of pressures uh, from society. Well, actually, uh, very honestly, we don't know what led to this. So. Uh, We'd be probably assuming it uh, deeply that it is because of all those statements. But one thing is for certain. We create our realities through the con conversations that we are surrounded with. Mm -hmm. right. 
those uh, conversations, whether they are true or they are false, they actually affect us. Indeed. We cannot save well, ourselves that's a from... That's good point. Where does a, you know, a young child, I'm assuming, I don't know if it's a boy or girl, who we don't girl, know yeah, who's behind, girl, yeah. Yeah. No, th who all, wrote all this. The yeah, yeah. So where are these children? These are children. Where are they getting these concepts? I mean, most hatred is, is taught, it's learned yeah. at home from the parents, you know, general attitudes. I mean, yeah. generally speaking in America, we've got a real problem, a social illness rushing through America where we have racism. And some people say, well, that racism was already there. We yeah. have political correctness, which is sort of a racist idea in the first place. Mm -hmm. And Trump comes along and he taps that base, that middle American base, who feel threatened by anyone on the outside, and he just plays that card. Mm -hmm. Now, did he just wake it up and people feel now open and they're not apologizing for their racism? Mm -hmm. Or is he drumming it up and exacerbating it, yeah. and encouraging it? I don't mean directly him. Yeah. Is, he, is he opening that can of yeah. worms? Yeah. Because Moyes, you know, certainly, as Kirsten brought up, this is a child, and yeah. your children. <laughs> that's, right. that's the biggest right. thing. And on the, other, on the other end, again, there's a child, probably. Yes. I, I would Indeed, assume yes, so. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, so right. that child is also being affected. And I don't think that the effect is only through Trump. He's surrounded by people. Okay. So most probably, you know, all those conversations, they affect the child, and it ultimately results in this uh, kind of a reaction. So what I feel is that unless we get a bigger picture, a completer picture of the whole thing, we cannot really pass any judgments about right. whose fault it is. Right. But one thing is for certain, that we get affected. Yeah. And we need to look at the whole thing from a perspective, not just for America, it is a bigger perspective because uh, there will be backlashes as well. Yes. You know, I think that uh, uh, whatever incomplete information we get over here, mm -hmm. there'll be people commenting on that and uh, there'll be reactions. And that is not really fair. Again, we'll be affected by the conversations that we are surrounded with. Mm -hmm. But it's, that's true, that dialogue and what we're exposed to. We've got the internet now, fake news. Yeah, right. you know, that have impacted the elections. There's no yeah. question that's irrefutable that that happened. Yeah. Um, I think everyone accepts that. So do you, do you but, think, Kirsten, this is an honest uh, reading of American society because you know at the same time I wanted to of course I we think, want to be balanced in the sense of you know in the midterm elections that have just passed by we have, we've had two Muslim women who've just come at Ilhan Omar yeah. and and Rashida Tlaib have won in their respective areas um, that's that was a huge gain it's for a Muslim really, women it's isn't a it? bittersweet time mm. it's mm. a bittersweet yeah. time because you have this progression not just a Muslim but a Muslim female yeah you know now there's better representation that's the that's the good thing that's yeah. a good aspect for this young girl that she's got now stronger representation yeah. as a Muslim and as, as a little girl yeah. um, yet I think at the same time we're sort of working at cross purposes because we have the most violent adolescent population mm -hmm. in the world in America. Mm -hmm. uh, hatred is a very strong emotion for a 10 year old child. Indeed, and, and Moise, I wonder what you think about that as well, because you know, it's, it's important to, to talk about the fact that America is a society which is very multicultural. Um, what does that mean to you, though, in context, of course, as I put to Kirsten, the wins in the midterm elections for those Muslim women, A, and then B, when we see the sort of Islamophobia or hate towards any minority in the United States? What do you think of that, Moise? I, I would think that it's a great lesson for people like us uh, sitting over here and commenting that we generally are prone to you know, generalizing a particular thing. This is a wonderful lesson on both sides. I mean, on the one hand, we have this uh, thing happening with the little child, and on the other, we have, uh, you know, uh, two, two women uh, from uh, Muslim, uh, uh, you know, communities getting elected. Mm -hmm. So I honestly feel that it's a wonderful lesson that the societies and the comments that we make should not be so generalized. I mean, societies and individuals are not the same thing. Yeah. If an individual has committed a com crime or, or uh, perpetrated uh, something wrong, yeah. it doesn't mean that it should be generalized to the whole society. And I'm not just saying that we should not be doing that. Yeah. The whole world is prone to do that. Yeah. And we should learn a big lesson from such incidents that, yeah. you know, if, uh, uh, if there's something wrong, if there was Hitler in Germany, yeah. there was Schindler as well mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
So how can we say that the whole of the German uh, nation was wrong? Yeah. No, they, they were good people and they were bad people. Yeah. So this is a wonderful lesson actually. Yeah. And of course, the trend, and we can probably talk about the whole world, Kirsten, but specifically in the United States, the FBI has reported something. Um, hate crime has gone up 17%, I believe the number is. Mm -hmm. um, there are obviously issues with that statistic as well and how that is gathered. Well, but I, what does that say about the United States specifically, well, do you think? Well, I take issue with the percentage. I don't think we have any reliable analytical mm. research. Okay. Uh, I mean, in fact, um, ProPublica came up with a, st a report, in fact, that said that only 12, 12, that's a dozen out of 50 states or more, yeah. um, are actually not training their police in their academies mm. to even understand the term hate crime mm -hmm. and how to identify a hate crime. So if that is going on, and then a lot of things aren't being reported mm. for various reasons, I mean, certain you know, groups within this hate crime, whether it's sexual orientation, mm. they're not going to come forward if they haven't told their parents yet that they're homosexual. Mm. Or a black person or a Muslim person actually feels at security issue if they yeah. come forward. They don't want to put any attention to it. Yeah. So I don't think we have any clue. We can't gauge the seriousness or the enormity or, or the size yeah. because um, if we only have so many states that are actually looking into hate crimes and taking it seriously, yeah. then there's a lot of statistics out there that haven't been done. Exactly, and, and I think that yep. uh, such statistics should be questioned a lot. Mm. Whose statistics are those? Mm. No, absolutely. So why, why do you think, Moy, is that there isn't more, why aren't there more resources being put towards, uh, you know, tackling hate crimes, mm. for example, in the United States, but we can talk about the whole world, really, can't we? I think we probably are a little confused. I mean, uh, there's a political correctness about things. Yeah. Uh, if there's a hate crime in Pakistan, mm. how many people would, uh, would come out? How many people from the mainstream Muslims would come out and say that this is wrong, this mm. should not have happened? Because we probably don't feel it that much. We, we probably lack the compassion that we have, that we should have for the whole of the community. Mm. And this goes for the whole world. Mm. This is what I feel. So, but, yeah, yeah, I find ahead, that sorry. I mean I find that a bit sad because America used to be a yeah, country exactly where exactly. you were accepted. I went to Catholic school in Texas. Mm. Mm. I had a Muslim friend in my class. I had several Jewish friends in my class. It wasn't an issue. So what changed? Uh, something has changed. <laughs> I think we changed our role models. I mean, uh. I I think. A lot of how the economy has changed. Yeah. People have less opportunity. You're yeah. in debt before you go to college. Mm. So that competition mm. is felt more for the young people. It's no longer yeah. we're all buddies at college. It's like, who's going to get a job? Mm. And am I going to pay back my college yeah. debt? It's a whole nother it's a whole other way of being a young person. And, yeah. you know. Moise, you mentioned role models. I yeah, think it's an interesting thing to expand. We yeah. probably, uh, you know, if that guy is doing this, or that uh, group is doing this, yeah. then why should I be, you know, kinder, mm. or why should I be more compassionate towards them? Mm. And this has actually gotten us into a, a, mm. a downward spiral, mm. generally. Mm. That we have actually, rather than putting the principles on top, okay. we have put other people as our role models. Right. And I, they are never going to be I would perfect. say reality television yeah. is responsible. Quite right, yeah. quite right. People have yeah. really generally. lost their principles. The media yeah. generally, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, it's a, it's a fact that uh, blood sells. Yeah. I mean, and this goes for the media generally. I mean, there are so many. I, I was really uh, quite enchanted by a YouTube video yesterday, which mm -hmm. showed that you know there's a uh, there's a patrol that has just been initiated in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm which is known as the happiness patrol. It has to be in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> it, it is known as the happiness patrol, yeah, yeah. which we, they, they follow the cars which are actually abiding by the rules. You don't smell it too much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't project the good things happening around us. Right. We are generally looking at the bad things. Well, I mean, we're talking about, mm, there's that, that, some that's positives a good, here that we're discussing. Exactly. But, but that, that is, that is a good, good point though, isn't it, Kirsten? Because especially when the, it comes to the United States, you know, I feel like from this part of the world, sometimes we're quite critical of it, sometimes legitimately so, of course, by many of its policies, but credit should be given where it's due, right? As I mentioned, that's that true. midterm election that's issue, true. we should be balanced in our view of the U.S. Shouldn't However, we, I, such I still think we've got a long way to go, and we may be heading for worse times because of 
mm. because of the mm. the vaguity of what this hate crime right. is, because we've got no understanding of delineating the issues within that, the right. Islam issue, the right. sexual orientation yeah. issue, the race issue. Yeah. And there's no no research that clearly tells you, it's explicit what the law is, yeah. but nothing clearly tells you the, the punishment or how exactly. it's going to be taken. You know, you're a terrorist. Yeah. And a minor, how will we deal with that? That's okay. Most minors, do they really know what a terrorist means? Yeah. Secondly, I will kill you. They mm. definitely know what that means. Yeah. Indeed. And a lot of these hate crimes have manifested into actual violence and murder. Yeah. Exactly. And young, these are young people as well. These yeah. are predominantly uh, young people. I'm just going to take a quick time out on the very, sure. very important point because as uh, viewers would know that we're talking about children here. We're not talking about adults. We're not talking about, um, you know, adults targeting adults. We're talking about children targeting children. Where have they learned this from? Why aren't parents, why aren't school officials, why aren't authorities, why aren't those in, in, in you know, in positions of power dealing with the situation? We'll be right back after this break. Thank you for remaining with Scope. I'm Akar Rizvi, and we're discussing, of course, Islamophobia in the United States with our esteemed guests. Um, before I go to them, I just wanted to contextualize for viewers about what this rise in hate crimes means. Um, there was a Twitter, there was a tweet, pardon me, that was put out by a journalist in the United States uh, showing a graph, really, of how severe the increase has been from 2016 to 2017. So if I could just uh, request that that tweet be put up with the graphs um, at the time because that's very important I think to show uh, the progression of what's happened in the United States uh, just of course for our viewers to get that 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 context of what we're talking about hate crimes of course not just against Muslims mind you but against a whole variety of, of minorities in the United States uh, anyhow let, let me go back now to our panel of guests so we were talking before we went uh, Moise again about the fact this is children I, I wanted because you look at society as a whole Moise and you're an expert in that fact what kind of an effect does this have on children? And then what does that mean for future generations? I think it is, it is going to be a, a very scary thing, obviously. The first thing is that it's tragic, but it's, the effect that they're probably going to take is that they'll be scared of going to schools. Yeah. But I think a more important aspect that I would like to point out is that if this thing, un, God forbid, if, if it spreads, you know, as I just said that, you know, we have, we have wrong role models. Probably we, as a reaction, the whole world might get into that spiral. Mm. You know, if, if uh, because Americans are, is, at the moment, they are uh, opinion leaders in a way. Yeah. They are role models for many, many nations. Mm. We aspire to be like them. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing would be that, that you know, such things become our uh, aspi aspirations again. Yeah. That'll be a big, big, uh, that's a big fear in my own heart. Let me just let the viewers know, as, as Moise was there was speaking, we were showing, in fact, the, the, the tweet that I was talking about and the graphs as tweeted. Um, Kirsten, I wanted to bring you in because, again, the, d the discussion always goes to future generations, doesn't it? What does the future hold for a country like the United States, which, again, is a melting pot, so many cultures living side by side and have been doing so for s so many years. What does this mean going forward, do you think? Well, I like to sort of take a step back, too, okay. quickly, and look at the past and say, wow, when I was growing up, it was you had to throw a punch on the schoolyard. That was the most you had to come up with to get yeah. through okay. bullying or whatever. And to come to this place now, I think the way we manage this is going to be so important for future generations. Um, what is what I find positive here is that it is a broader issue, mm -hmm. hate crimes, and, and I think that stems from lots of things, and some of it from so much labor being exported outside of the United States and jobs being lost, and that resentment yeah. was mm -hmm. very deep, and I don't think people understand how deep. We've got whole towns and communities just laying as a wasteland, industrial communities. Yeah. No longer do we have coal miners. I mean, these are topics for documentaries now. Yeah. So America does have a feel, there is a feeling that things are being taken away from them and that's where I like, think this resonates. However, the broader picture and where valuable insight comes in is that you have this little girl. This gives us a narrow scope to look at the issue. This gives us a person, we don't know her name, mm. but we all care about this little girl. I care about this little girl. I'm mm. sure everyone does. 
no one wants this to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is bringing a lot of sentiment up and a lot of protective feelings and people are reverting back to our, our civil rights and wanting to protect those. So I think there's hope for the future in that vein. Okay. And I think the way this principle is handling it and the way other, the community is you know, rallying around her gives a great message. Uh, you know. I wanted to pick up, if you, if you allow me, Kirsten, on something that Kirsten there mentioned, Moyes, which I wanted your thoughts on, is does this have to do with the economy? Because, you know, we, we had that recession, worldwide recession in 2008. I think does it? it's, do you it's think? a very convincing point. Yeah. This is a very convincing point. But uh, one more aspect that I would like to talk about particularly is that, you know, every time... Uh, Going downhill is easier. Okay. Going uphill requires a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, these things are, are now, they should be accepted as realities now that, you know, if these uh, hate sentiments are being spread, mm -hmm. what are we doing as an educational policy matter, mm -hmm. as a general media policy matter, or uh, general, you know, education, upbringing, training of the general public? What, what do we plan to do? How do we? Uh, teach the uh, teach the masses to um, uh, you know uh, manage their emotions about mm. these things, to navigate their emotions about these things. I think these are big issues so which really. Let me let me push you on that, and let's yeah. let's be specific then for just a moment, if if you allow me. Let's look at the Muslim community just in the United States. It's not based on religion, but based on how they react to such matters. Do you think that the Muslims, as a whole, worldwide? react in a healthy fashion to when they are targeted by hate crimes? Do you think uh, the Muslim community is doing enough to portray a positive image no, of itself? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think they, they need to again think that a hate crime is committed by individuals okay. ultimately. It is a social phenomenon, but we should not actually label the whole society as, uh, as the criminal society you know, or, a cri or a perpetrating society. We should actually look at these things as uh, individual, you know, uh, going going haywire. Uh, that's the only way uh, we can hope to yeah. sort of uh, be more tolerant towards each other. I mean, things do go wrong. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, when uh, when something happens to the Americans, for instance, mm -hmm. in America, mm -hmm. nobody says that you know Americans are so bad. Or when something happens over here uh, in Pakistan. Nobody's going to say that Muslims have committed these crimes, mm -hmm. you know, this, these crimes. These are, always, they, these are always individuals who are actually pinpointed. I think the same should go there. But, um, but you know, Kirsten, you know, you know the opposite argument, that, that a, Muslim, a Muslim would say that if a crime such as this was committed by a Muslim, God forbid, towards any other minority in the United States, it would oh immediately be laid. You know, you know, you know, I mean, we, that is we, equally wrong. Be, yeah, exactly. But, but I mean but that I a lot of Muslims would then use that as an well, argument, wouldn't they? I mean, yeah, absolutely. And when I was hearing him talk about, like, we need to do more to sort of look at this issue and how we're going to tackle it, how we're going to set yeah. up programs. And there are these programs are in place already. The very good ones mm -hmm. and I think where where I have an issue is the sense that our general in America specifically there is a feeling that is put from the media from the president-elect Trump himself a sense of constant threat making the American population the, the middle class the farmer mm -hmm. feel that they're under some kind of feigned threat Mm -hmm. And it could be the immigrants coming over the Mexican border. It could be the Muslims living down the street. But these people are out to get you, you know. And there's mm -hmm. this, and it's really insidious. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think the way to counteract that is not to set up specific Muslim community programs. Those are there. I think the best way to counteract that is to get the the law enforcement. Like where I read somewhere. I read somewhere that um, in the training of the academies, where there's only so many of them, that mm -hmm. the actual trainers themselves mm -hmm. are sometimes the perpetrators of hate crimes. Mm -hmm. So we've got a very endemic, mm -hmm. thick issue here. Mm -hmm. True. Okay, so, so Moise, I, I, wonder, I wonder your thoughts about that, because you know, it's, it's important for Muslims not to be ghettoized, right? It's important for Muslims <laughs> or any minority not to separate themselves from the rest of society. Because uh, I imagine that you would, you would also agree that it's important for that interaction to happen, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that is what creates the society. And that is what would change the conversations. I started from this point. I started exactly from this point that conversations affect us. And uh, I'm 
almost 90% sure that this child, because the, on the other end, again, there's a child yeah. who's committed this, uh, you know, who's brought this situation upon himself and upon the girl. But uh, he was affected by conversations. And these conversations change when our audiences change, when our surroundings change. We get exposed to many other aspects. Otherwise, we'll become so, you know, limited in our uh, exposures. And that has been a problem with many, uh, you know, uh, when I was in America, that was, uh, this is about 2008, mm -hmm. and somebody asked me, what do you think about the people? I was with uh, a group of Muslims who had gone there after the, you know, the 9-11 incident. Uh, we were sponsored by the University of Louisville and uh, mm -hmm. the State Department. Mm -hmm. And somebody just asked me, what do you think about these, uh, the Americans? And I said that uh, I think they're very upright. Mm -hmm. They, 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 they have the courage to stand up for what they think is right, right. and they're very ignorant. Mm. And uh, because at that time, this is what I felt, because people only knew about their, their you know, villages, their towns, their cities, and that was it. The CNN that they would uh, uh, you know, get uh, exposed to over there yeah. was not the same CNN that we used to see okay. over here. <laughs> well, so, well, well I, I know, Kirsten, I'm sure you had something to add to this, but we'll have to unfortunately leave it there at that. But of course, we learned a lot from this conversation with the both of you. We appreciate Kirsten Seymour and, and Moiz Amjad, our in-house analysts here at Indus News, for coming in and sharing their thoughts with us on this very important topic. As Moise there ended off his answer, I think that was an appropriate concluding point to make, that it's important for communities to interact especially in the United States, but throughout the world, really, for such incidents not to happen, for children not to be exposed to any such hate. And we, of course, hope for that to happen in this specific community as well in the United States. I'll be back after a short break with our next topic. Viewers, thank you very much for staying with Scope in this half of the show. We're going to be talking about, as I mentioned earlier, the financial corruption case that just occurred in the Islamic Republic of Iran where two men were executed. One of them called the Sultan of Coins for hoarding upwards of, of two tons of gold coins. Uh, this, of course, at a time of sanctions, etc. We have two esteemed guests joining us um, uh, here in our studio. We're joined by Dr. Sikander Ahmed Shah, who is an analyst. Dr. Sikander, thank you very much very much for joining us. And we also have on the line joining us Dr. Salman Shah, who is an ex-finance minister uh, of Pakistan. Dr. Salman, thank you very much for joining us uh, on The Scope. Um, Dr. Sikander, if I may, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, just as a whole, of course, about such cases, uh, considering, of course, you're an international law expert? Yeah, I think you have to uh, uh, see this case in the, in, the, in the global context in which it's happening. Iran's under extreme stress at the moment because of US sanctions. And these are the strongest sanctions they are seeing uh, through various executive orders passed by President Trump. And they want to send a message domestically to uh, anyone, whether it's a small trader or a big trader, to basically not impact the economic, the weak uh, and the extremely fragile economic uh, system of Iran at the moment. Because yeah. Iranian banks, Iranian governmental institutions, all are under sanctions where money can't flow in and out of the country. And gold is the only real currency through which they can maintain some form of stability. And, and Dr. Salman, what, what are your thoughts on the case? Well, I think this is a global trend also, and uh, it is also because of uh, Iran's special situation. Uh, globally, uh, corruption and, uh, and non-transparency is becoming very difficult to sustain. And uh, uh, we can see this happening in Pakistan, in, you know, in Iran, and everywhere else, even in China. Uh, there is a crackdown against corruption. So I think that uh, the Iranian situation is also uh, following a global trend. Dr. Salman, if, if I may, because you mentioned the, the example of China, and I'm glad you did, do you think in the example of China that China has succeeded in this regard, and do you think that Iran will succeed in this regard as well? Yeah, I think there is no option, but uh, for all countries uh, which are beset by such issues, uh, you have to uh, make sure that this succeeds. And not only it succeeds, but it also leads to economic growth rather than shrinking of the economy. So the challenge is that you have to do it very 
in a in a transparent fashion and in a very fair fair manner. Okay, and that, that then brings me to my next point, Dr. Sikander, because that is then always um, a concern, isn't it, in such cases, especially in a, in a country with pressure on it, such right. as Iran. Can, can, these such, can such trials be free in such a situation, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, while China has uh, managed to, uh, I mean, China has done the same thing, but they are a very different country. Iran is under tremendous stress, as you mentioned. But also, while globally there is an uh, impetus towards clamping down on corruption, uh, it's different understandings of corruption and also how penalties are awarded. Uh, in any Western country, to award capital punishment for uh, financial crimes or white-collar crimes is, is unacceptable. And as I mentioned earlier, Iran is under tremendous other forms of stresses, right? And so that might be leading to this. But I think that there are serious concerns because there are international commitments as well. Iran, while hasn't ratified a number of human rights treaties, but they have ratified some. So I'll give you an example. The most important uh, uh, international human rights treaty, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it, while, doesn't, while not prohibiting capital punishment, it clearly lists that it has to be uh, maintained for the most serious of crimes. Mm -hmm. And also, there has to be a certain procedure, which, which involves uh, uh, you know, uh, appeals mm -hmm. and due process, right to, right to life. And I think there are serious concerns in this regard vis-a-vis -vis Iranian, the Iranian execution, because it's happened in a very expeditious, expeditious uh, manner and uh, not a lot of transparency in terms of how the trial was conducted. And the courts were also set up uh, ad hoc quite, uh, you know, it was mm. basically in response to the, uh, I would think that some people would argue in response to the actual sanctions itself. So, so I think uh, corruption globally, I would agree with Dr. Salman Shah, is something that is globally being looked at. But I think Iran's case is unique. It, ha it, is, it is to an extent uh, conflated with uh, the economic pressure they are facing as well as the, the political system that they have in the country. Uh, Dr. Salman Shah, then what, what do you make of that? Do you think that uh, a case of financial corruption such as the one uh, that Iran has just executed these two men for, do you think that that warrants the death penalty? Uh, do you think that that really then discourages others from carrying out such financial corruption as well? I think it is certainly uh, uh uh, 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 kind of a deterrence and uh, given the cultural milieu in which Iran is operating in at this point in time uh, it might be acceptable to the people over there mm -hmm. uh, but of course uh, I mean the pressures on the Iranian government are tremendous and it might also be a way of uh, releasing some of those pressures that uh, the problem which Iran is facing is to a certain extent due to uh, certain segments of society who are indulging in maybe capital flight or they are doing the money laundering or they are, they are some kind of uh, uh, leakages from the system mm -hmm. which are not in the interest of the Iranian nation. Uh, so there could be a political uh, background to all of this but traditionally uh, Iranian uh, legal system uh, has relied on uh, on the death penalty to a, to a great extent. Uh, so I think uh, globally it might not be that acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the local domestic audience, it would be uh, it would be okay. Uh, but whether it will be effective also is another important point because. Clearly, if uh, there is capital flight out of Iran and it is still under sanctions, uh, Iran needs every bit of the money to stay in the country. And also, they need to uh, make sure that uh, these people who have the money actually invest it in Iran for the purpose of economic growth and strengthening the economy. So it's a very complex uh, situation and uh, the Islamic Republic is going to tackle it in the way it feels best. Okay, so Dr. Dr. Sikandar, I'm wondering then, uh, um, 
not getting too much into the political atmosphere within Iran because it is, of course, complex. But do you think that this does send more of a political message than a message really about just corruption and, and other such vices? Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would definitely agree. I mean, I think uh, statements animating out of uh, the government in Iran also is in relation to the sanctions in the backdrop of, this, uh, of these executions are also le reaching out to the poor strata of Iran, talking about social reform. Also, I think that this is definitely political. I mean, I would, uh, I would um, uh, equate it with how the, US was how the U.S. tackled terrorism and the laws they then instituted within the U.S. Uh, when that was a threat for them uh, on the basis of national security on in the airline industry, in terms of how freedom of speech was curtailed in the U.S. and expression and, um, and so uh, to an extent. So I think that Iran sees this as a national security threat. And I think uh, at the way they define this crime itself, I think it's like serious uh, crime, economic crime against the state is, 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 evid is evidence of that fact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also how they em employed so certain injunctions of Islamic law which focus on those political gravity, how you, the state is challenged, uh, points to the fact that it is, this is highly political. Okay, so Dr. Salman Shah, you know, I, I wanted to uh, bring this into context for our viewers uh, who are obviously watching us from all over the world. Uh, it, it, let's, let's, for example, use Pakistan as an example, if, if we may, Dr. Salman. Um, Pakistan obviously also wants uh, and is in the midst of an anti-corruption drive of sorts, according to the current government and previous governments as well. Uh, do you think that neighboring countries of Iran are right now looking at this anti-corruption drive in that country and taking any lessons both uh, either for or against? I don't think so. I think Iranian uh, model is a homegrown model, and uh, uh, it has been kind of uh, practiced for the last 30 years in many instances. And if you remember the war on drugs, which the, uh, the Iranian government yeah. really enforced the death penalty in those kinds of uh, situations, and now financial corruption is something which is probably uh, very high on, uh, on their priority list. So uh, as far as uh, get, getting lessons from other uh, countries, I doubt it if the Iranians uh, are actually looking at other countries in this respect. They are, this is their own, I, I, I presume that this is a homegrown uh, solution to their issues. Dr. Sikandar, I imagine that the Iranians would argue that any country and every country should go after uh, people who are corrupt in the harshest of uh, fashions. What, what do you say to that? I mean, I, I think that, first of all, I would like to say that Iran, I would agree with Dr. Suman, Suman Shah, that Iran has a very effective legal system when it comes to uh, making sure that the writ of the government is established. And I think that uh, there have been previously instances of uh, corruption that I'm aware of, where they've actually come down really harshly on uh, on, on sort of uh, on government officials, even. Um, so I think that I think Iran uh, is is looking at it. I would agree internally. I think the message that they're sending across is that you know we will try everything in our power to maintain the stability of our economy. Uh, and I think corruption is something that they're using right now as a mechanism, but I think there are other mechanisms that they will use as well. Okay, so, so I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Salman Shah, if you when, you, when you look at the situation right now as it stands in Iran, do you think that such court cases can go after those who really are the ones who, who, who are corrupt? Because, you know, and I wanted to see if, if um, uh, the gallery can, play, can show these tweets. Uh, these are tweets in Persian, but they talk about um, the fact that Iranians seem to be aware of the fact that yes, even though the Sultan of Gold Coins, as he was known and titled, um, and he, yes, he had two tons of gold coins, but the question that Iranians are raising on Twitter is, where did these gold coins come into his hands from? Somebody somewhere high up enough would have had to approve that to be able to come into this man's hands. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of that, Dr. Salman? Well, it's difficult to see whether this, uh, uh, this is something which is kind of a strategic uh, policy uh, which the Iranian establishment is uh, playing out and uh, is this directed at some political uh, 
opponents or the, or, or the various factions within the Iranian regime. So uh, it would be difficult to uh, I mean, connect all of this. But certainly they are using the threat of sanctions or the uh, sanctions which are in place to kind of uh, in implement or at least uh, uh, project that they are going to do uh, be very harsh with people who are going to indulge in any kind of corruption or money laundering or, uh, or smuggling for that matter. In fact, but the issue really would boil down to is if the, if the uh, sanctions are going to be very biting sanctions and then uh, the Iranian uh, government has to break some of those sanctions. Uh, one of the ways of breaking those sanctions would be uh, clandestine kind of operations like smuggling or money laundering uh, to help the Iranian government. So uh, I don't know what is the motivation uh, as far as that is concerned. So it could have multiple uh, dimensions to this whole thing. Indeed. Uh, and Dr. Sekunda, I wonder where your thoughts are on that, because one does wonder then, looking from the outside in, of right. course, um, if you're not going after the very people who allowed for this situation to, to, to be created, where two tons of gold coins came into this man's hands, will you really be able to solve corruption through these courts? Yeah, I mean, I would still like to maintain that I don't think it's really about corruption uh, per se. I think, I think also I would like to point out that there might be the complexities within the Iranian political system might, uh, from, an, uh, from, uh, from Pakistan or from outside, might not be as, uh, as clear. But I think there are domestic stakeholders. There are people who were against entering into these arrangements on, on a nuclear proliferation uh, or you know, having a, you know, this nuclear program and how it was to be retarded. Uh, for peaceful way, means, mm -hmm. uh, and that those arrangements with the European powers in America, and they are from within even questioning that. So it could be a, a strategy of political diversion as well. And also, I think that um, within Iran, there are different voices. Uh, you know, there are the stakeholders within the political system who are not in government or the security establishment who have different incentives. They are Iran is involved in a number of conflicts. Uh, uh, you know, or, uh, or is interested in a number of conflicts li like that in Syria and, and, and in Iraq to an extent. Uh, and as I think that uh, this would be one way to either put pressure on a certain faction or the faction or the government trying to uh, distract, uh, uh, in a way, I w uh, the, the public in certain ways for the pressure that is being created through, uh, through the sanctions and through uh, other sort of wars that are in the region. So I think it's very complex. Mm -hmm. I think it's not just about corruption. Mm -hmm. Dr. Salman, I, I wanted to ask you, in the context of a country like the Islamic Republic of Iran, when you're an investor, for example, in a hypothetical situation, looking from the outside in, for a country that says it needs a large investments in various different fields, uh, what do you feel that the message is for those investors looking at this sort of anti-corruption drive? Many would argue, and Iranians would argue, that it's, this is a good thing for an investor, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it would be a dampener on lots of... Uh, because, I mean, if you look at it, Iran is still a very informal uh, kind of an economy and uh, it is not... you don't have very large uh, kind of uh, companies or corporations which one could say are, 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 are highly organized or highly... Mm -hmm. uh, documented and all that. So there's a lot of uh, uh, a bazaari culture in the economy of Iran. And to be uh, distinguishing between what is corruption and what is the informal market or, or what is uh, uh, money from uh, government uh, kind of uh, uh, leakages, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is going to be quite difficult. And so in that sense, I think Sikandar is right that this could be a very political thing which is uh, happening over there. Uh, but given that they are just going to be facing some uh, issues of uh, liquidity in terms of dollars, 
uh, maybe they want to make sure that this kind of activity comes to an end and the Iranian state is able to lay its hands on a lot more uh, dollars uh, for its own purposes. Uh, and Dr. Skander, then what do, you, what do you think is the message that international companies and those, of course, that would require laws and standards to be maintained to invest in Iran, do you think that they're getting a positive or negative uh, message from these courts that have been set up? I mean, I think that uh, uh, these international companies are currently mostly sanctioned. Mm -hmm. And they would not, I mean, I think that uh, maybe for the future, when there are no sanctions on Iran, but then we are really looking at this politically, really. So yeah. I think that, uh, and I also, this is an interesting question arises that uh, the countries from which these com companies are sort of hail from, I mean, you're looking at investment in oil and gas exploration, these are mostly Western countries, mm -hmm. uh, either Western countries are under the influence of the US or US countries, uh, US companies themselves. And they currently can't trade with Iran. And I think this from a US perspective will be seen as more a political stint, uh, stunt and how it affects, uh, I mean, uh, how Iran is trying to, uh, you know, send a message even to the US that Okay, we will we will do this, uh, and you know you can you can accept you can you can treat it as whatever it is. But I think that um, uh, there is, as I said, there is particularly for companies investing in Iran. I don't think there's much because companies are looking at other interests before they actually start looking at business ethics and corporate codes, uh, which are important. But I think that Iran is primordially struggling, and companies investing are looking at. Uh, the actual sense of what a business is rather than looking at these, these, uh, these complicated mechanisms that would follow in a country that has established itself, that is looking for its investment, that is not under any form of sanctions, that has a good reputation, and I think Iran's far from it at this point. Uh, Dr. Salman Shah, I wonder if you agree with that because you know the Iranians and especially the Rouhani administration would argue that listen, we're doing everything in our power to act, in fact attract investors and they would show off uh, possibly to the world that listen, Europe is still standing by us even though, at least on the outside, even though these U.S. sanctions have been placed. Uh, what, do you, what do you feel about that as far as investment and you know, corporate codes, etc. go vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, I think uh, basically, once the American sanctions go in, uh, it would be very difficult for Iran to actually uh, attract foreign investment of very large global companies because the Trump administration would be able to crack down on them very effectively by uh, blacklisting them. So I think if there has to be any busting of the sanctions, it will probably be companies from China or Russia and maybe from India. Uh, those kinds of companies which, uh, which can withstand the pressure of, uh, of the Trump administration. Uh, so I would, uh, I, I don't think uh, Iran would be very successful in attracting multinationals into into Iran, and so I mean we'll have to wait and see how it pans out. So uh, at this stage, I don't know whether the Iranian government is really interested in in attracting these large uh, uh, companies. It may be willing to. Uh, focus on smaller, unknown mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, companies, and maybe uh, companies which 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 are totally outside the U.S. influence. And Dr. Sikander, you know, one of the arguments I think needs to be to be made is that about the legality of these sanctions altogether. You know, um, that's something that Iran has, mind you, brought up over and over again over the years already, ever since the revolution, right, right. Uh, in essence. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a very good question because, look, we're looking at not uh, UN sanctions, we're looking at uh, uh, U.S. sanctions, mm -hmm. right? And from a domestic perspective, U.S. is constitutionally, you know, or through various executive agreements, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating these sanctions. Now, there are bilateral arrangements that the U.S., in fact, is, is basically, um, you could argue there are legal commitments, 
uh, that were in place. But the US actually is moving away from that. They recently stepped away back from, a, from an FCN treaty, a friendship and navigation treaty that was entered into with Iran. Uh, uh, and they basically said we are not, so they're trying to limit their legal mm -hmm. liability with Iran by, by, by renunci renunciating any legal commitments they had with the country. Now, um, one could argue that uh, the U.S. is violating certain customary norms of engagement under international law uh, with Iran by not acting in good faith because uh, as we all know that Iran either was complying or had the intention of complying with these uh, conventions, uh, these arrangements that were entered into with the European powers, with the U.S. in place. And you could argue there's bad faith involved and there are legal arguments that you can raise. But unfortunately, in the legal, uh, international legal uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, area, uh, you really don't have a lot of recourse if you're Iran because if there are no bilateral treaties, uh, you can't go to the ICJ, which was the basis on which they went to the ICJ, and the U.S. now has renunciated that agreement. And also, uh, from a multilateral perspective, uh, you know, the Security Council actually enforces ICJ judgments, and the U.S. is a permanent member of the Security Council, and they will always veto anything that Iran manages to uh, win, either in the courts or in the general uh, in the Security Council. If it has support, the U.S. will uh, will, will sanction any or will veto any any resolutions. So really, Iran doesn't have a lot of options in the, from mm. an international law perspective. Um, I wanted to ask Dr. Salman, you know, you're a man, of course, who I'm sure appreciates diplomacy uh, as a former minister yourself. Uh, what do you think the U.S. image is like right now, specifically, of course, in the way that it has acted when it came to the Iran nuclear deal, the way that it has reimposed these sanctions? Yeah, I think uh, the American move has not been widely appreciated by Europe and the other members of, uh, of the international community, but America has the means of inflicting great deal of damage on companies which will actually uh, bust its, its uh, sanctions regime. Uh, so I think, and at this point in time, the Trump administration really is not trying to get any uh, brownie points for being very civilized about the whole thing. Uh, so I think that at this point in time, the whole pressure is going to be mounted on Iran to, to kind of amend its policies vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and uh, what's happening in Syria and other, uh, other tension spots, particularly in Gaza and also on the West Bank. So I think that uh, uh, if there is some backing off by Iran uh, after these uh, sanctions, uh, then there would be some uh, a lot of pressure to have those sanctions removed. Very well. Well, we'll have to leave that as, as our final thought. But of course, we do appreciate both of your, you gentlemen and you taking your time out to, to share your very important thoughts with us uh, today here on The Scope. That was Dr. Salman Shah, the ex-finance minister of Pakistan. And of course, we had in our studios Dr. Sikandar Ahmed Shah, an analyst who was joining us here. Um, one of the important things I think that Dr. Salman there mentioned at the end was specifically this about the United States and its role and how it's acted towards Iran vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear deal. But of course, the fact that Iran now finds itself in a corner Will such anti-corruption drives do enough to, to allay the fears of its own domestic population? Will it be able to see itself through uh, this pressure that it finds itself in right now? That, of course, uh, the days to come will have to see. We'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much for watching.